Good morning. I was a senior in high school the last time Kentucky beat Florida. So can we give it up for Kentucky? <laughs> we have a lot of Florida State fans in here, I can tell, because only the Florida State fans were probably, I'm just going to sit this right here, okay? Just so you can see that. Man, I actually didn't get to watch the game. I fell asleep. I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a night owl, but man, I, I woke up this morning. I texted Sid Hare at six o'clock this morning because he's just been harassing me for 20 years now. We've been here, you know, and every, he, I thought he was not even going to show up today, but he was here. So, hey, I'm, ex I'm excited. For, I'm excited that you guys are here. I'm excited about this journey that we're on with uh, Freeway, the Not So Perfect Guide to Freedom. Annually, I meet with a group of pastors. I, we do a roundtable discussion with about 12, 15 pastors in, in really healthy, larger, growing churches. And we gather together and we talk about issues that we all face in our churches. We talk about our culture. And one of the things we do is we talk about series that have really impacted our churches over the last year. And one of the series that just continually comes up over the last couple of years has been this series, Freeway. So this Freeway series is a series that's been done in hundreds of churches. And many, many, many lives have been changed. And so welcome to Freeway, the not so perfect guide to freedom. And the reason we say, the reason we say it's not the perfect guide to freedom is we don't have this thing all figured out, but we're going to lean in. We're going to press into God together. We're going to look at his word and we're going to go over this thing for the next several weeks in a row, about six weeks beyond today. We're going to just dive in here and see what God can do that we can unearth in our lives, that we can dig out in our lives to give ourselves the, the greatest, most fulfilling life possible in Christ. And I told you guys this, you're probably tired of hearing about it, but about three, about three months ago, Michelle and I moved, we downsized in our house. And, and we, because we lived in that same house for 13 years and downsizing, we had to really go through and just decide what things we're going to keep, what things we're going to sell, what things we're going to give away, what things we're going to trash, you know. And so one of the things we looked at was our couch. And, and if you looked at our couch, you would think, oh, this is, this is not a bad couch. It's got some scars and some war wounds from rough housing with kids and letting the grandkids jump from one couch to the other. We didn't let our kids do that, but we have grandkids now, so, you know, like, like we let them do that and then send them home. So you guys who are grandparents, you know about that. But, you know, we look at our couch. If you came and sat on my couch, you would think, oh, this is a couch worthy of the name. You know, this is a good couch. There's nothing wrong with this couch. But we knew that many of you were going to come over and help Michelle and I move through this process. And we didn't want you to, like, take the cushions off our couch and see some of the junk that we had accumulated in our couch cushions. And, and, and so uh, we decided to do everything that we could to get our house ready to clean so that when you guys came over, all the areas that we didn't do a good job at or we just normally don't pay attention to in our lives, we want to make sure that those areas were clean. And so I would take the, I took the couch cushions off and man, the things that we found underneath of there, you know, we, we, found, we found dryer sheets, we found uh, rogue socks, you know, that had been missing for a long time. We found popcorn kernels, we found uh, candy wrappers, gum wrappers, and we found some things that we had really no idea what they were. There was a McDonald's french fry that may have been there for three years and still looked like it just came from the, you know, from the, from the store. And before we moved, we flipped the cushion, cushions over. Man, that's when we found all this stuff. And so in this series, in this series, this is what we're going to do. We're going to flip the cushions over in our lives. And we're going to see what kind of stuff that we need to get rid of to have true freedom in our lives. And I think most of us, I know I do, I don't want you guys to see the areas in my life where I don't have everything all figured out. I don't want you to see that. I try to give you a window into that and be transparent in my life. But there's areas I don't want you to really see that. And, and I think for most of us, when we walk in here to church, we have this prideful part of us that, that we want everybody to think that we've got this thing all figured out in life. We don't want people to look underneath the cushions of our lives. But I think if we're gut honest, I think all of us have some areas that we can do a little internal cleaning to help us experience the greatest freedoms that God wants us to experience. So let's flip some cushions. Let's flip some cushions over the next seven weeks. And here's how you can get the most out of this series. I want to give you three ways that you can get the most out of this series right now. Number one is I want you guys, I'm going to challenge you to make it a commitment to come to worship for the next seven weeks in a row. 
Make this a commitment. Will you dig in with us? Will you make this your highest priority in your life? You you plan and you prioritize making sure that you eat every day. You plan and prioritize that you're going to go to work every day, that you're going to pay your bills on time. You work and you prioritize that you're going to get the kids to football practice and to get to ballet and volleyball and you know, parcheesi or whatever it is that your kids are involved in. We, we, you know, we prioritize those things. Why not? Let's give it a shot to prioritize one of the most important things that you were created for to come and worship our creator and to be a part of community. Will you commit to that over the next seven weeks? That's how you're going you're gonna to get the most benefit out of freeway. The average person right now, they say the average church person going to church right now, the regular attender, the person who calls themselves a Christian, the regular attender is going two out of five Sundays. If you only come to two out of, these, out of this series, it's not going to have the impact. And if you make this a priority, I'd like for our church to be different on those stats and like, like make this a priority in our lives. The second thing is, and this might sound a little strange, but be on time. Will you commit for, I know some of you are laughing already. You're going, I don't know, I've never been on time since we started coming to church here. You know, but, but make, it, make it a priority for you to get up earlier or whatever you have to do to be on time. And here's my commitment to you. We're going to work really hard on our end to make sure from the time that you walk in to the time that you leave, everything is all about the message. And if you're showing up late, you're missing something that God wants to prepare your heart for in order to do something later on in the service. And so we're going to work really hard at making these next seven weeks. We do that all the time. But for the next, next seven weeks, we're going to work really hard at making sure from the time you walk in here, at the time the service starts. By the way, service starts at 9. I just thought, you know. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw it. We changed from 930 years ago, you know, a long time ago. So anyway, commit to being on time. The third thing is connect in a small group. And when we're together on Sunday mornings right here, this is our gathering space for motivating each other, for encouraging each other, for recalibrating our soul, for remembering the sacrifice for Christ for us. And, uh, and we're going to do, do what we were made for in our worship time. And it is so valuable for you to be with us during this space and during this time on Sundays. But as we often say, life change happens best in circles, not in rows. It happens best in circles, not in rows. And the way that you can get the most out of this series is for you to get into a circle with people that you can develop deeper relationships with. And in the process, you will find that many of the same challenges that you deal with in your life other people in our church are dealing with that same thing. And you're not alone in that. And it is so important. It's so vital to, the, to, our, to our continued growth in the journey of being a Christ follower to get in circles and not just in rows. And so here what we're going to do on, this, on the Sunday mornings, we're going to give valuable insight at the 30,000-foot level. And then on the same topics, you're going to talk about that and break that down into a much lower view here of what that means for you in your life and talk through that in small groups. And so I just want you to commit to that. Small groups are starting today. They, they are launching today. And so if you're not in a group, let us help you find a group that you can jump into. Now, if you're planning on going through Rooted, today is the launch for Rooted. And we're going to be, I'm going to be sharing what that means for you after uh, second service today, starting about 1230. And we're going we're to roll out what that means for you in your journey. If you've been hearing a lot about that in Rooted, I want to invite you to come. If you go through Rooted... What we've done through this series, you're going to find that much of the series is going to parallel what we're going to be talking about in Rooted. So if you have a choice between the two, you're not going to miss anything if you, do, if you don't do the neighborhood groups and you're going to do Rooted. We would prioritize Rooted first. We want you to go through Rooted first. So that launches today. If you're planning on doing it, make sure you come back at 1230 today um, and you'll hear what, what all it is entailed. All right, so just, I just wanted to lay that out. That's just kind of the way you can get the most out of this series. Make Sundays a priority, be here on time, don't miss a thing, and get into a small group. All right. Whew, I seem like a lot there. Now I got a 45-minute message. <laughs> Not really. All right. So I do want to kind of launch us off of freeway with this message. One of the most famous parables that Jesus ever taught was the prodigal son. We talked last week, even on Labor Day uh, weekend, what a, a parable is. A parable is a story where Jesus would teach 
something from an earthly viewpoint to people so that they could relate to it. But it had a much, much greater meaning for our spiritual life. And on this occasion, Jesus is going to share a story that in many ways I think relates to all of us in some way or another. However, in this story today, Jesus throws in some very countercultural ideas about the love of a father that because of our culture, we might miss some of the greater meanings of this story. A lot of times we focus, when we, if you've ever heard a message on the prodigal son before, we focus on the son a lot of the time. Or we focus on the brother some of the times. Uh, but today we want to focus on the love of the father. And when he tells this story, he gives three different actions by the father in a story in a way that culturally the crowd would have heard what Jesus was saying and they would go, no way. There's no way that a father would do that or say that or act that way in Middle Eastern men culture during that time. There's, they would, the crowd would hear Jesus' story. And for us in our culture, we wouldn't think anything about it. But in the Middle Eastern father in that culture, the crowd would have said, there's no way that a father would do that. Do you have things that your dad just would never do? Can you think of the things like just your dad would never do? As I was thinking through this about things that Middle Eastern fathers would do, there's a few things that my dad would never do. You know, my dad would never cuss. He just didn't. He didn't cuss. He didn't tell crass jokes. He didn't tell raunchy jokes. He, I, didn't, I didn't learn cussing until I was on staff with Tyler. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> He just didn't. We didn't my, my family didn't cuss growing up. My dad would not drive a Chrysler product. Man, I mean, he was, I'm sorry for you guys who are Chrysler product guys, but, but he was a made in America guy, but he would sooner drive a Toyota than he would a Chrysler. I mean, I had to wait until he passed away before I could buy my first Jeep, you know, because he just wouldn't. And the third thing is he would never dishonor women. He just didn't. He always held the door. He was kind of a Southern gentleman guy. He always treated them with respect. He always elevated women in his life. And he was a great role model for me. He was just so modest. But I remember one time, uh, we, Michelle had just had, Michelle and I had just had our son Hunter and uh, he was breastfeeding. And so, so we were visiting my mom and dad and it was time for a feeding. And Michelle's also very, very modest, but my mom and dad, you know, they didn't really, I was adopted. So they didn't, hadn't been around breastfeeding very much. It was kind of a new thing for them. And, and so Michelle was sitting in the chair in my mom and dad's living room as we were visiting it. And she was breastfeeding Hunter and she, and her modesty, she had a blanket covered over Hunter's head. My dad just came bebopping in the room. He's like, well, hey, little buddy. Whoa, whoa. Oh, he, he didn't know what to do. He didn't know what to say. He didn't look at Michelle for the rest of the day. I mean, it was like, you know. <laughs> I've laughed about that for 23 years since he's passed away. But some of you, some of you might not be able to. I just want to give you this kind of word. Some of you might not be able to relate to a father's love. And I just want to say I'm really sorry about that. I'm sorry that you had that experience from the sin of our earthly fathers. But what I hope you'll grab onto today is that you'll see in this story that the love of our heavenly father is completely and radically different than any love of any father that we could ever have on earth. So let me tell you the story and then I'll share with you some of the ways that God's love is just so different from what the listeners would have thought about relationships with their fathers. In Luke chapter 15, verse 12, we'll read this together. It's going to be on the screen, but if you have it pulled up on your phone or, or Bible, you can follow along. Matthew, or, or Luke chapter 15, verse 12. He starts off, and right off the bat, he starts off with this thing that would have been countercultural. He says, a man had two sons, Jesus says, and the younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. And so his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Now just right here, this first verse here, what the listeners would have heard, they would have said, what? That's crazy. Who would do that on two accounts? 
First of all, the crowd would have thought, what son would dishonor his father for asking for the inheritance now? It's like the son saying, Dad, I wish you were dead now so I can have my inheritance. And the crowd would have heard this and thought, what son would have ever done something like that? But the second part of the cultural difference for us was there's no way they would have thought, there's no way that a father would have given his inheritance to the son early. And the crowd would have thought, what kind of father does this? Normally, when Middle Eastern fathers were on their deathbed, he would call his family in right before he dies and he would give the bulk of his inheritance to his oldest son, not even the youngest son, and then he would divide up the other possessions later. You get the iPhone, you get the car, you get the camel, you get the motorcycle, whatever. You know, He would divide those things up. But he would never give his inheritance out early. And so in this very first verse, we see this first point of the father. Our father that Jesus is talking to, God, wants to give you your inheritance now. God wants to give you the inheritance now. What that means is today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Salvation is not just fire insurance. Salvation is not just going to heaven when you die. He wants to, our Father wants to give you the inheritance now while you are living Salvation is actually just as much for you right now. You don't have to wait till you die to experience the love and the grace and the freedom of this life. I see people and I've, I've known people that they've been on their deathbed and they've, they've rejected Christianity all their life. They've rejected Christ all their life. They're on their deathbed and they make a confession that they finally believe. I believe, I believe if their heart was right, it doesn't matter if you're in the 11th hour of the last minute, if you confess your sins to God, then he can save you and he is the judge on that. And I believe that you can make that last minute. But why would you? You miss out on so much of heaven here that God wants you to experience. He wants you to experience his glory on this side of heaven. He wants you to be on a freeway to him, not a twisty, bumpy country road. He wants you to experience him now. We often don't think about that. We often think that we come to church and we give our life to Christ because we want to be saved when we die. God wants you to experience his glory here now. He's just going to give you a glimpse of it. We couldn't even stand it right now if we had his full glory. Well, the story goes on. A few days later, this younger son packed all of his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. So put this in our context. Think about this. Maybe you ask for your parents' inheritance early. They give you $50,000 and you go to Vegas. That seems like what, that, that would be like Vegas in my mind. You go to Vegas and you're spending all your money and buying friends, buying prostitutes, uh, gambling uh, all your money away and uh, snorting whatever else up your nose. And that's what this guy was doing. You know, he was just living in wild living. But as it does, as about the time his money ran out, A great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. Anybody, has anybody uh, raised pigs, on like pig farmers? Not just like, I'm not talking about one pig that comes in your house and you bathe it and all that. I'm talking about like (laughs) true pig farmers. You, you, You guys know. You know what it's like. I never raised pigs, on, but I've helped farmers. There was never, ever, ever a time in my life after what I've seen pigs eat and what the, you slop, pig slop. And there's never been a time I've been so hungry or desperate that I would think I've got to eat this to survive, you know. I mean, I've eaten things that will make a billy goat sick, but I would not eat, you know, I would not eat that. All right, so uh, he finally comes to his senses. And he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. So I'm going to go home to my father and say, and this is where he starts working out his plan, what he's going to say, and he's probably rehearsing this all the way home, you know. Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Could you please take me on as a hired servant? And I just imagine him on his way back, I just imagine him rehearsing this. Father, will you please forgive me? Uh, I'm not even worthy to be your son, but I'll just even work here if you can just give me some food to eat. He's just rehearsing this thing. And so he returned home to his father. 
While he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. And filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. His father ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Now this would have also been a crowd shocker here. Because a Middle Eastern man would never run. Running was considered undignified. Running was considered improper. Very different from our culture. When we read that, we don't think anything about it. You know, we put on our shorts and and shoes and lace up our shoes and and we run, you know. Some of us need to run a little bit more. But, But Middle Eastern men, they didn't run. And so you can just kind of picture this scene. Here's this man dressed in a robe with chains around his neck and in sandals and long hair. And he's been waiting and waiting and watching out the front door day after day. And when he finally sees his son coming, he doesn't wait for the son to come crawling back and ring the doorbell and groveling and pleading to come home. He sees his son off in the distance and takes off running in an undignified manner and wraps his arms around his son. And here's the point I want to make to this. When you stop running from God, God will run to you. When you stop running from God, God will run to you. Think about this too. The son has just come from the pig pen. I know most of you haven't seen that or worked with pigs, but I'm telling you, there's nothing clean about that. They're nasty And this means the son must have been filthy. I picture this scene where he has rotted food ground into his whatever's left of his clothes. He smelled like a pig pen. He's got pig snot dripping off his face. And yet we don't see the father going, ooh, uh, son, you need to get a bath first. Let's get you cleaned up and then you can come home. He doesn't say that at all. He runs to his son, welcomes him, throws his arm around him, even kisses him on the cheek. And what that tells me about our father, what Jesus is trying to tell us here is God doesn't wait for you to be all cleaned up. He doesn't wait for you to have all the junk cleaned out from underneath your cushions. He comes to you, he runs to you, he accepts you, he welcomes you with his arms open wide and wrapped around you and all of your filth and all of your sin and all of your guilt and everything. You don't have to get your life right. You don't have to get clean. You don't have to put on fresh clothes. You don't have to get all the garbage cleaned out. You don't have to feel ashamed. You just need to come home and our Father will run to you And wrap his arms around you. And he'll say, welcome home. He'll say, welcome home. So his son says to him, after been rehearsing this in my mind anyway. Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. And I am no longer worthy of being called your son. And it's almost as if the father just said, yeah, 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 we'll get to that. But the father says to his servants, quick. Bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Doesn't wait for him to take a shower for the finest robe. Bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his feet. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we've been fattening because tonight we're having steak. I added that part in. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. And I love this. I love this about Scripture. And so the party began. This would have also shocked the crowd. Because no one during that time would have thrown a party and celebrated if a son had lost the father's inheritance and then tried to come back home. In fact, culture would have had it. It would have been just the opposite of that. Culture would have had the community would have brought clay pots filled with rocks and nuts and shattered the pots in, the, in front of the house to symbolize that they are cutting this person off from the community as an honor to the father who had passed away. That's what it would have been. That's what they would be expecting at the Middle Eastern hearers in this culture at this time. That's what they would have been expecting. But the father kills the fatted calf and has a party. This Father's love that we have for us, church, this Father's love is so radically different than any love that you could experience on this earth even. 
And when the wayward son comes home, this father throws a huge party. And for us today, when you finally come home, God wants to celebrate you. God wants to celebrate you. So in the beginning of this journey, I just want to ask, maybe some of you have been traveling away from God. Maybe, you, maybe some of you can relate totally to the story of the prodigal son. Man, let me tell you, our father loves you so much. He's ready for you to come home. He's ready for you to come home. If you've drifted, he's ready for you to come home. If you've rejected him, he's ready for you to come home. If you said, God, I wish you were dead, he's ready for you to come home. No matter what, our father's love is radically different. And he's ready for you to come home. And when you come home, he will celebrate you. He will celebrate you. So I just want to, I want to spend some time here. I want to spend some time thinking about this. I want you to kind of look at this scripture. Think about this series, Freeway, and the challenge that I gave you. And I want you to think about the sacrifice that was made, that the Father's love is so radically different that God wrapped himself in skin, stepped onto earth in the form of a man, a sinless man who was God in the flesh, who died for us so that we can have this freedom, this complete freedom. And he wants you to experience it. He doesn't want to wait till you die and go to heaven. He wants you to experience it now. Doesn't mean that your life's going to be perfect, but when you experience God, you experience true peace, true joy, true happiness, true love, true grace, true mercy. So I'm going to pray with us, and then I want you to spend some time doing some business with God. So some of you, you, you may need to sit right where you're at in your seat and just reflect on these questions. What did I hear today and how am I going to respond? For some of you, 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 need, you need to come home. Some of you need to come home and we would love to pray with you at the crosses. Some of you have been drifting. You can also come to the process, you know, maybe what we've talked about here this morning has nothing at all what's going on in your heart and you just need somebody to pray with you. We are also would love to pray with you during this time at the crosses. And then as families or as individuals, you can come to the, there's four stations set up for communion. And you can come and remember the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us on the cross by taking the bread that represents his body and taking the grape juice that represents his blood for us, all right? So let's pray and let's have some movement, okay? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word and how it convicts us and it penetrates our soul, God, when we're just open to it. Father, I pray specifically for anyone who is here today who has been running from you, that they would stop running and allow you to run to them, to welcome them home. I pray that they will come home to you. We pray, God, as this time of remembrance for what Jesus has done for us on the cross, we don't take this lightly. We don't stroll to the tables. We, we come reverently to the tables and we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. And God, for our time that we spend in prayer with you. We know that you will hear our prayers, God. Thank you for the way that you love us. Thank you that your love is radically different from even what we experience here. In Jesus' name, amen.